Welcome to Prompt Brand Innovation, a podcast about brand and innovation strategy in the age of ChatGPT. I'm Joël Serre, your host, and today I have the privilege to welcome Krish Massoud, Marketing Manager at Arnott's. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today, Krishma. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit more about you know, who you are, uh, what you do? Yeah, definitely. So my name is Krishma. I'm currently a marketing manager at the Arnott's Group. I look after our uh, big flavored snacks brand called Shapes. So if you haven't heard of it, it's a big uh, local jewel in the Australian uh, snacking world. Probably one of the most iconic savory snacking brands that we have. Uh, so I look after essentially 360 brand planning, end-to-end innovation delivery, um, basically bringing to life uh, all the new ideas that we have for the brand, whether it's filming our next campaign, uh, talking to new consumers, uh, bringing out new innovation that uh, you know hopefully sets the sets the Australian consumers' palates uh, on on fire, all of the above. And then in addition, I also look after. Uh, our kids snacking collaboration with Louie, uh, which is also an iconic Australian uh, show, uh, and, and looking at that part of the portfolio. And previously at Arnott's, I was working uh, more on innovation uh, over on the TV snacks uh, portfolio. So you might have seen like the Krispy Kreme donut collaboration, uh, things like that. It sounds like that you, you really have your, your hands full. Uh, and especially, I mean, Shapes is indeed an iconic brand, you know, a, a household name in, in, in Australia. What, what's, the, what's your favorite part of a job among all the things you do? I think my favorite part of the role is that I go down the grocery aisle probably every week when I shop. And not only do I get to see my beautiful creations on shelf, but I actually get to see so many people in store shopping things that I've created. And I feel like we're kind of contributing to this beautiful moment of their day where they get really excited about something. And there's a couple of stories I'll share that I guess kind of give you a bit of emotion behind what I mean by that. So very, very recently I launched something and there was a big tower that was in a, on a display uh, at Coles, which is uh, one of our local grocery stores. And I saw two children running up, picking two products up and then running back to their, their dad and throwing it in the trolley and saying, I really have to try this. And as a marketer, as someone who slaved away on that project for seven months, seeing that and seeing their excitement and their delight just over something so small as biscuits, Truly, truly, it's something that's just, you know, it, it always just sets your soul on fire and makes me personally feel quite grateful for what I get to do. This is great. I mean, it makes it worth it. It's that kind of little moment of happiness that you're creating, you know, for people. And, and, and I think, especially at the moment, we do need to get or find as much happiness as we can where we can find it. Uh, where, where do you get your inspiration from to come up with, you know, all of these initiatives? I think inspiration is almost everywhere around you if you can look for it. I love going to various different grocery shops. I love shopping different aisles. I love looking around the world and seeing what the world is doing. I love social media. You can learn a lot from being on social. So I personally run a small lifestyle blog stroke kind of brand uh, kind of page. And all the time you get people throwing ideas at you. You'll see kind of various things on TikTok of consumers creating their own versions of iconic snacks. There's almost inspiration everywhere you look. And I think that kind of crowdsourcing or I guess democratizing ideas and steering away from saying, oh, it has to be a perfectly buttoned up concept to more of a, oh, it could just be a nugget or a jewel or a gem of an idea. And then you ideate and bounce off that. I think that's where the magic, uh, I guess, can happen. Mm, I like what you say about inspiration, you know, coming from so many different places, you know, I'm not necessarily looking at, you know, what's happening in your category. There's just so much things happening on TikTok. Is there or are there any particular trends that you that you follow that you see emerging and say, ha, I think that's going to have an impact in my own business. So that's actually worth following that trend. All the time. I would say from a consumption behavior point of view, just how people are consuming and how that changes. So, for example, uh, the snacking world is obviously always under attack when you think of the baddies in the world like health star rating, sodium, um, sugar. These are always considered baddies. So usually the trend is healthier eating, healthier lifestyles and, and all of these great things. But what's exciting is when you get a brand like Shapes, People are buying shapes because they want a delicious flavored snack. 
they're not buying it to be healthy. So sometimes it, it pays off to be conscious and cognizant of the trends that are coming up in your category, but actually actively choose which ones you want to play in and which ones you don't want to play in. And if you do want to play, how do you want to play with which brands? What's the right fit for, um, for the brand together with the trend that's coming? I guess um, I'll give you an example of, of mm -hmm. a, a trend or I suppose um, an idea of inspiration that then led to another um, sort of NPD. We, we see a lot in the world of fusion of foods. So what I mean by that is you get, you know, what you get when you cross a croissant with a donut, you get a cronut. Um, you see those sorts of things pop up everywhere and create super widespread attraction on social. Um, and we kind of took something like that and said, well, what do you get when you cross a donut and a biscuit? And voila, we did a partnership with, uh, you know, Krispy Kreme and created donut biscuits. Um, things like that where the nugget could be anything and it's a trend from anywhere, um, but you can apply it to your own aisle and your own category in a really unique way. So I'd say that's mm -hmm. kind of a good example. Yeah, very much so. And in fact, these collaborations seem to be very much uh, en vogue, uh, uh, you know, as we could say. There's so many brands announcing collabs, you know, whether with other brands or with artists, you know, so on. So it seems to be a, a kind of a, a branch of innovation on its own collaboration. I love it. Collaborating is one of my favorite uh, things to do because it allows you to tap into unique and incremental audiences and various spaces um, without having to do too much. So a good example I would say for me recently, um, we've partnered with Xbox um, and, and created almost this exciting giveaway program for consumers, you know, stepping into an inflationary environment. We know consumers are wanting more from their purchases. We know they're wanting value and they're wanting value beyond just price. So we created a really cool partnership to give away um, lots and lots of pro, uh, prizes with Xbox. And then to celebrate that launch, we created a really special limited edition run of uh, controller shaped shapes. So Xbox controller shaped shapes um, to give away as prizes, but also uh, created sort of an influencer campaign around that as well. And not only does that, you know, give new life to a brand like shapes, which is, you know, you can't necessarily ideate on the shapes core. You can't necessarily change anything about the product because the loyalty is so high. You don't want to really tamper with anything. Um, but you want to talk to a new audience. So this sort of partnership allows us to talk to a gaming audience. It allows us to be really relevant with a much younger audience in a, in a way that's quite synergistic with both the Xbox brand and the Shapes brand, which is why I think there's a, a real power in partnerships. So actually, uh, so the, uh, uh, the, the promotion with, uh, with Xbox as well you know, on social media, because we see people were talking about it because indeed it's pretty cool. And it just made me think about Shapes as a brand. And as you mentioned, you know, you, you, it's, it's all almost like a platform it seems that the brand the brand can do so much with that concept uh, it's it's really ripe for partnership because it's so scalable and flexible you know in terms of you know the changing the shapes the, the recipes the ingredients limited edition so on and so forth you know not pretending that there always will be a core but you could basically run so many seasonal promotions or you know uh, exclusive LTOs basically with with that not many brands can afford to do that quite lucky because our manufacturing arm is obviously located in Australia and we're, we're not a global brand, we are very much a local brand which allows us to operate with a lot of flexibility. Um, I've obviously come from a global kind of role and global backgrounds working across both Unilever and Procter and & Gamble so I, I appreciate the, the the differences between both but you're, you're right, we're very lucky, we're in a very unique position to be able to do that um, and we're also in a unique position to be able to partner with our retailers to get closer with what they want. You know, the market in Australia is essentially a duopoly um, between two really large supermarkets. Uh, you know, if you look at the rest of Asia, it's quite different. It's it's modern trade is actually a bit smaller and general trade and sort of those more mom and pop style shops are actually more what you see. So it's very hard for brands to execute some of the things that we do. Because you've been involved in so many different innovation projects in different types of companies, I would be very interested to hear about have you seen recurring common challenges when it comes to innovation project? Or is it really different to each company? Or are there patterns in the say, ah, you know, innovation projects, there's always these challenges that keep coming back? Yeah, there are definitely very, okay. very common themes. I mean, the reality is we're all marketers with access to the exact same data. 
So we will all look at that data with different eyes, different uh, lenses, but we're all actually talking about the same challenges. And at the moment, they're the same, I would say, from a snacking point of view, um, no matter where you are in the world. There's a focus on better for you and offerings that are, you know, more healthy. There's a focus on things that are more indulgent and more decadent and take you into spaces of true relaxation. Um, and then there's other areas of, of, I would say, snacking, such as your, your I don't want to change, legacy, loyalty, mm -hmm. heritage, nostalgia. Um, and all of those things aren't necessarily going anywhere. So often you'll see... Uh, the, the biggest challenge with innovation is sometimes because we're all looking at the same data, because we're all seeing the same growth trends, we're all actually coming up with our own take on the same idea or the same insight. And because we all have very much the same insights, it's almost a bit of a, well, who can get there first? Who can do it best at the best price? in the best way, partner the retailer the best, um, and get there as fast as possible, which I think is recurring, um, honestly, around the world. And I think the other part of that is you you see like everything old is new again. There'll be ideas that people have launched in the past and they come back again and they'll bring them back with a new flair and they'll say, okay, well, what failed last time? How can I fix it and how can I bring it back? I see that happen um, quite a lot. And I think the last part of it is really whenever you're thinking about innovation, particularly on really big brands, so think of the brands that Unilever has, the brands that P&G has, or even Arnott's, these are legacy brands. These are brands with sometimes 99% household pen. They are huge. So the appetite for risk is also very different mm -hmm. because you don't want to risk the core of the core um, declining. And, and a great example is on Shapes. Um, before I joined the brand quite a while ago, the company did uh, have a project where they tried to innovate on the core to change the uh, formulation to better suit what they felt consumers wanted based on research. Uh, and it turns out nobody wanted any change to their mm -hmm. core shapes. And in mm -hmm. fact, it was the biggest disengagement with the brand and with retailers. And to this day, consumers still say, I swear you never changed back. I'm so upset. Um, and the, that actually did more harm than good. So I think that's a big challenge for any, um, any company and any brand, which is when you've got such a big brand with such high, high household penetration, how do you truly talk to incremental new audiences without losing what makes you who you are and without losing who your big base already is? Would you see that's one of the main reasons why companies find it so hard to innovate sometimes? The fact that they can't uh, put the dial between, you know, uh, tradition, legacy versus, you know, uh, innovation, new audiences. You know, it, it's just too difficult and that's kind of, it induces paralysis or, 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 or inertia. Do, do, do you think it's a big challenge? I think it's a, a huge single-minded challenge, which is we'll often start with a brief that says we want to revolutionize the category, bring something dramatically new. Uh, the team will go away and work on something like that and we'll say, whoa, that's way too far away. I just want to evolutionize. I just want to do a little bit more. But the problem is that little bit more is not incremental. It's just cannibalistic to what you're already doing. So I think there's a fear of pushing too far and alienating. Um, and that's, that's really challenging because the, the only way you can profitably grow a business is to create profitable innovation that's highly incremental that adds bolt-on audiences to the brand. So I think it's a real dilemma between um, not wanting to alienate your big base and also needing to do it quite profitably. Otherwise, it's unsustainable growth. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Do you have an example of a company that got that right? I mean, apart from like startup and technology, which is much easier to come up with new, uh, new, 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 new offering uh, to an extent. Do, do you have an example of a company that you think really struck that balance between, you know, heritage, tradition, and and reinvention? Because this what it is about. Basically, it's to secure tomorrow's growth today to a certain extent. 
I think I'll try and use an example from my own camp of what mm -hmm. we've tried to do, um, and I think it's quite interesting. So very recently, um, I launched a range called Fully Loaded, so it's Shapes Fully Loaded. So I actually chose to launch a sub-range in the existing aisle that had a completely new proposition that laddered back up to our core proposition of Shapes, which is flavor you can see but approached flavor through a different eat with a new texture that's very different to our core product. Um, and what we did was we found a way to line price it with our core so that we weren't, you know, perceived as too premium or, you know, trying to be something that we're not. Uh, we kept the existing packaging from the perspective of um, format, so it's the same box size, um, but we radically dimensionalize a new design to really chase a Gen Z audience. So it's a very young, very youthful, very, I would say very cool, but I'm not Gen Z, so I won't, uh, <laughs> I won't put words in their mouth. Um, and what we tried to do was make sure that it, when we were creating that project and that product from ground up, we had a very clear cost structure, a cost target that allowed it to be very close from a profitability point of view to our core, which means that when we grow using that innovation, we are actually growing from a profitability pool point of view. So you, you have no reason not to invest. I think the biggest challenge is when innovation comes at a cost to core, it's very challenging for businesses to redirect funds from their core to support the innovation. So I think getting that balance right of saying whatever innovation I am launching must be accretive or at least net net same as core in some way, whether that means um, reconfiguring the product, reconfiguring what price point you're charging, reconfiguring what pack format um, you know can, can work for you. But making sure, sure your P&L really stacks up is the best way to make sure that you don't fall into this trap of um, what I call is the year two curse. It's the I've launched it, it's there and I've left it and now I can't do anything with it because I put all my money in year one and now I've got to go focus on the core. Yeah, yeah, and and then usually basically the, the the product kind of like died off. I was seeing a stat not long ago. I think we're saying that uh, something like a quarter to all uh, from a quarter of all new product launch basically didn't survive a year, and forty percent didn't survive a two years mark. And the conclusion of the report was that kind of an academic study looking at over 80,000 product launch and what happened next was that indeed the lack of support was one of the uh, chief reasons. So it was launched and yeah, we've done our job and let's hope it will fly on its own, but very often it doesn't, it still needs to be supported. And exactly what you mentioned, which is where does the money come from? It comes from the core and we can't afford to do that because as you say, it's very highly competitive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So very interesting, very interesting. Just a quick aside actually on the, uh, how do you reconcile that with uh, uh, working on white space innovation? So for example, anything from brand, scratch, brand, brand stretch to uh, re reinventing a category or creating a new one from a brand, because surely if you can't have the same metrics to deliver the margin equivalent to a call for, for that, you know, but yet still you need to fund it. So, so how does that work? I think in that regard, you have to take much more of a portfolio view. You can't take a brand led view. There's going to have to be portfolio white spaces that you're chasing that maybe don't come at that, uh, you know, GM accretion. Uh, but there has to be some that do. And I think if you're striking that balance from a total picture business point of view, that will enable you to support them. Otherwise, I still fear you're going to fall into the exact same uh, trap, which is no matter what, it is unsustainable to chase unprofitable innovation, even if it is white space, because at the end of the day, incrementality, if you're making an extra $5 million in incremental sales, but you have a negative EBIT line, you're actually net net not making any money, you're better off not doing it, you're better off just chasing your core in the first place. So I think my, my thought there would be to try and take a slightly um, bigger step up. The other thing is, as brands get more scales, so as you know, new kind of innovation comes up in a white space that you find scale for, um, there is a part, always a pathway to profitability, even if it starts off a little bit uh, potentially negative. Before you launch, if you know your pathway to profitability, whether it's I need to sell X units or I need to find a cheaper manufacturing solution over time and you already have lined up that, you know, that might be in year three or year five, um, that then at least allows the business to say, okay, it's um, perhaps a negative uh, 
VC or sorry, a negative EBIT line at this time. Mm. Sorry, all companies use different uh, acronyms for their PL, so I'm trying to use the the standard and <laughs> the standard mm. ones. But if it's a negative EBIT to start, and you know when it's going to become positive, and you know what the payback period might be for whatever capital you've um, you know you're asking to invest in, then at least yes, there's a line of sight to being able to invest. If you had a magic wand, uh, what is it that you would change into that uh, process from uh, ideas to uh, market launch to, to make it more effective, to make it more productive? I think I'll answer that in two parts. So mm -hmm. in terms of making um, idea to launch more effective and more, I guess, seamless, uh, in doing that, I think the big thing that I would probably want to change is in terms of how we... Um, engage our customers along the way so often when we're running at a particular pace it's very hard to get customer engagement in that time period when i say customer i mean in an australian landscape you have a consumer you have a shopper and you have a customer you almost have three audiences every time you're doing anything and you'll pick up um, insights along the way from all of them but it's very hard on on such a tight timeline to get all of it together. In addition, we compromise heavily on research. So we operate in more of a, let's launch it, let's uh, you know figure it out. And if there's something wrong, we can always change it after we've launched. Um, and that's just the back, matter of fact, when you're operating on such a short timeline, like new product development in five months, including packaging, you're almost at your second trial and you're about to sign off artwork right after you're doing your second trial, which is not easy it's very very fast you know it requires some guy to run from the factory over over to the computer put in all the details send that to corporate corporate has to put that into a, a system that system gets put into a inky list etc so i think in that process what you do is you create quite a lot of fast paced work for a lot of people um and the challenge is when you're always running at a fast pace every project that you're running is always on a six month timeline so it's wonderful you get to really do big things really quickly the flip side of that is you don't do very much funnel planning you don't do very much f27 20 30 thinking in fact i'll often have a company com companies come to me that want to uh, collaborate with me for like f25 and i'll tell them no no that's way too far away come back to me in a year <laughs> we don't work that far out um, and I think that's the flip side is uh, as we inch toward fast, agile, pace, uh, you know, running at speed, how do we balance the long and the short? How do we balance the long term view and the short term view when we're actually resourced very short term? It seems that Arnott is a bit more uh, seizing the reactive by seizing the opportunity today and we worry about the future tomorrow. Is it? Yeah, it's more yeah. seize the opportunity today, yeah. worry about the future tomorrow. And I think that goes back to the structure. I mean, the companies that you've spoken about, the companies I've worked for in the yeah. past, um, they're not run by private equity. They're, yeah. they're run as more of a, a, you know, it's a different structure. And the goals and the objective of private equity are much more short term. They are much more, yeah. um, you know, short term focused. And I, I, mean, I personally love it because, you know, I look back on my career in three years, 20 million in brand growth, incremental SKUs in the category, game changing various categories. I love it versus where I've been in global worlds where I might be on a, a project that doesn't even see the light of day after three years because for whatever reason, uh, you know, it, it changes and morphs. And I think that's, um, you know, it's the, the, the dual the duality of the situation yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely the, 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 the merit of small versus big is basically you can, you, you have much more of an impact and uh, you can do so much more in a such short space of time. So in terms of achievement, the kind of sense of self-fulfillment that you don't necessarily have when you have a, when you are cog into a huge machine. I mean, it's great for learning, but it's not necessarily something that deliver the, or the craft or the satisfaction of making an impact now on the market, something I can see. Yeah. Definitely. And I think the, the other part of that is when you see a trend that's coming in five to 10 years, and typically there's always what I would like to call beacon categories. So for example, um, soap bars takes a lot of inspiration from perfume and skincare. Mm -hmm. And the trends of skincare and luxury trickle down into 
various things, hair care, skin, you know, skin in grocery, skin cleansing, uh, deodorants, all of the benefits that you see actually ladder back up to what you're seeing in more luxury um, spaces. Um, for the snacking world, you'll see what ha is happening in fine dining, what's happening in um, other markets will trickle down as well. So mm -hmm. it isn't you don't necessarily need a 10-year focus um, unless you're creating really high tech that needs time to be developed. Otherwise, honestly, you're hypothesizing about the future. And in the snacking world, you can kind of already see where it's going. People want better choices. They want more premium choices. And they don't want you to mess around with the things that they love. Mm. Don't necessarily need a big report every year to tell you this. No, I think, I think you're right. No, 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 knowing what to change, knowing what to keep, I think is probably one of the most important things in, uh, uh, in innovation. What, what would be, if you had some parting words, you know, kind of like a word of advice for business leaders who are in charge of, the, of innovation, and if you wanted to give them one advice, it could be something that's often overlooked or something that they should avoid doing or something that they should focus on, you know. What, what would it be? What would you advise them to do? I think collaboration is critical and it's key. So collaboration with thought leadership together can create some beautiful things. So I think innovative leaders and innovation leaders, marketing managers, they can come with thought leadership, ideation, all of the great stuff, but being able to ground it back into tangible things for your cross-functional team partners who are the people who are going to actually make it happen for you, uh, that's actually what's really critical. And being able to almost talk the language of the guy who runs the manufacturing line, being so connected to that detail so that you understand and empathize with the challenges that they're facing will allow you to potentially see unique perspectives and piece them together in unique ways. And you might see see various challenges and be able to spot the solution uh, purely by having empathy for each and every kind of team member and each and each of the things and the barriers that they're facing. And I can give you an example. It's as simple as, um, you know, a manufacturing line has always done X, Y, Z. You're now asking it to do A, B, C. So there is a guy who is on that line who is going to run a trial who has to completely change how they're going to do whatever it is that day understanding his thought process, where he's coming from, uh, what is he planning to try, what are his contingency plans, getting into that layer of detail and not kind of saying, oh, well, actually manufacturing is not my skill set, I have no idea about it, and instead seeking to learn that detail will allow you to come up with potentially really unique uh, solutions to things that you may never have thought of because you're truly ideating with your cross-functional team partners. Krishma, I want to say a, a massive thank you because I think this was a, a masterclass in how to do innovation in a more agile and profitable way. So thank you so much again for sharing your insights and your, your experience with us. Thank you so much for having me.